Hey guys, my name is Roberta Peel from Oregon Trail Silver. I'm going to go over a little bit more in depth the technique of acid etching, okay? So, just to be clear, um, this works on copper, silver, brass, it, I mean, it'll work on just about anything, as long as you have the right chemical. You always want to use ferric chloride for copper, so if this little cuff blank right here was copper, then it would be using ferric chloride. But, because it's silver, we're using ferric nitrate, okay? So this right here is my ferric nitrate. I actually have it in a mason jar, and if you notice, it's labeled, okay? Label everything. <laughs> so anyhow, um, I've got my ferric nitrate. It's sitting on my coffee warmer right now, or candle warmer, whatever that is. And I have a hot iron. I also have, this is an um, investment shaker, but we'll go over different things that you guys can use for, um, for agitating, you know, here in a minute. Anyhow, so uh, ferric nitrate again is labeled on there. I also have the date labeled on there so I know how old it is. Most of the time, for me, I've found that it doesn't matter how old that it is, uh, most of the time. Uh, what matters is how much it's been used. But either way, I still like to label the dates. So ferric nitrate, uh, March of 2018. Anyhow, so um, in my last video, I showed you guys how to make these really great looking little templates, right? How to be able to print them out. Um, this one was printed out on an A4 letter size um, piece of uh, thermal transfer paper. Um, I've heard some really great things about magazine paper. I do want to try that next. I mean, it's really inexpensive. Anyhow, so then you want the metal that you have paired up with your um, with the chemical or vice versa. Uh, this one right here is uh, it's sterling silver. It's a Potter USA pancake die. Um, and I cut it out and the first thing that I did was go ahead and deburr it and cleaned off all the edges. Okay, because you want to make sure that it's pretty flat. You know, you always want to do that first. And I also hallmarked it where I'm going to put my stone. Um, anyhow, so what I did, and I'm not going to show you this part because you guys are pretty bright. A majority of you are. Um, what I did is I went ahead and uh, took a piece of Brillo pad. Um, I actually used the blue soapy Brillo pads and I used it dry. And I scuffed this entire surface and I cleaned it. And what that does is it removes all these, you know, it makes all these like little micro abrasions. Okay. And it, uh, the reason why you want to do that is because it actually gives the toner or the wax and the toner something to adhere to. Keep in mind that anytime you're using any kind of a, um, a laser um, printed image, you want to use laser printers because there's actually wax in the toner. Um, especially if you've got a really good printer. And what that does is um, it, the wax melts and it adheres to the metal so that when everything cools off, which is what this block right here is for, uh, so when everything cools off, you can just peel it off and your image, provided you did everything right, should actually stick. And I'm kind of hoping that the one, th I'm going to show you, I'm going to do this on purpose. I want to show you how it can go wrong. And then I'll show you how to fix it as well. Okay, so you know me, I'm totally a woman of many words. So, um, Anyhow, once I get the uh, Brillo pad, you know, scuff it up with the Brillo pad, my, my piece, I'm going to take some isopropyl alcohol. Okay, this is 91%. And the reason why you want to do this is to get all of the oils from your fingers um, and any, anything else that might um, prevent that, uh, that wax from actually adhering or your design from adhering. And you want to wipe it all off. Okay. And uh, you notice after that, I'm not touching the surface again. Now what I am doing though is going straight back and straight forth to make sure that I don't have any um, uh, like little, you know, little fine pieces of tissue paper or anything like that on there. Um, something else I want you to keep in mind as I wiggle this, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's pretty, you know, wavy because I've rolled out this metal myself. So um, anyhow, I'm going to show you how to go ahead and get past that if you're trying to acid etch on metal that you've rolled. So anyhow, you want to make sure that it's, that your surface is lint free, okay? And then what I like to do is I just like to take the actual design itself and just, you know, run it, run it through just to make sure there's no lint. Um, this is my way of doing it, okay? There's, everybody's gotten their own way of doing it. What I'll do is I'll put my image down first and then I'll take my metal and put it down where I want to place it. And by that I mean by doing this, it helps me actually line my designs up. So I can, you know, I can kind of like gauge where the design is and where it's going to be on my metal when I get finished acid etching. So that's why I like to do it this way. And once I'm pretty happy with where it's sitting, you notice I've got it on a paper towel. There's a reason why I do it with a paper towel. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I have a big paper towel. It's folded in half. I've got an iron. It's on max setting. There is no water in it. It is dry. And then I'm going to set it down on top. Okay, so while this is actually going, 
Um, I'm going to give it probably a minute. What I'm going to do is talk to you about different ways that you can actually agitate your metal, different ways that I'm aware of. Um, one of the things that you can do, like this one right here, <laughs> I'll turn it on, but it's probably going to shake a bunch of stuff. Okay. Oh, it's not plugged in. Anyhow, so when I turn this on, what's going to happen is it's going to vibrate through your, um, it's going to vibrate through the actual acid itself and it's going to agitate it and it's going to provide a really, really deep etch. Okay. So you don't have to get one of these, um, investment vibrators it's actually used for getting the bubbles out of your investment when you're casting. Um, what you can do, I've heard of people getting some of those foot spa things uh, that you get at the at Goodwill. Um, they they only cost a few dollars, and they do something like this: with they take their tub and they put it in the foot spa, obviously with nothing else in it. Put a lid on it, and then turn on the foot spa. It can agitate it. I've heard of people using um, little fish aerators to to agitate your metal. You can do that as well. Um, I honestly, it takes forever to do it this way. But I used to just kind of stop every five minutes and swirl it, <laughs> and, and you know, that works, but it's, it's highly time consuming. I found that by agitating, I cut my, my etching time down by about two thirds. So uh, somebody else had mentioned on one of our live feeds on Let's Make Jewelry that what they like to do is to use um, an ultrasonic cleaner. And I think that's pretty great. What they do is they just take and put it in a Ziploc bag, you know, nice Ziploc bag, double it up however you feel comfortable. If you're going to use an ultrasonic cleaner, I definitely recommend getting a cheap one and dedicating it to this just in case. And what they'll do is they'll take their metal and get it all prepped up and do what they have to do. And then they will, um, uh, and then they'll put it in the ultrasonic cleaner, just, you know, the whole bag with a piece and everything in it, and then agitate it that way. Um, somebody else said that they actually sit there for a half an hour watching television just taking their little Ziploc bag and scrunching it up. So, I mean, really whatever works. Anything, you know, think outside the box. Come up with something creative that works for you. Find something that you have in your home that you can dedicate to this because if something goes wrong and you're using a Ziploc bag and the bag punctures, you're definitely going to ruin that ultrasonic cleaner. There's no... <laughs> you know you don't want to you don't want to take that chance you know and and chance of cross contamination okay so there's that and now what I'm gonna do because I'm pretty sure this is only 20 gauge this is why I use my paper towels because I can just flip it and no my paper towels have yet to get caught on fire this is about the fourth piece that I've done with my um, with this paper towel and um, so far it's holding pretty steady so and I've done some really thick pieces with this. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to do, while this is still hot, um, I have an acid or a, a acid etching, or rather heat transfer burnisher. And what I'm going to do before this piece of metal right here really cools off, is I'm just going to give it a quick once over, just to see, just to kind of help it along. Do you have to do it right now? No, you can always wait until the end, but I found that I actually get better transfers this way. Now, when you do burnish, you want to make sure that you're burnishing in more than one direction. Go up and down. And I know that you guys can't see this, but I can actually look at it at an angle and see if there's any parts because of the, you know, the waviness or what have you of the metal, if there's any parts that really aren't kind of getting stuck on there very well. And, uh, and I go a little bit around the edges, you know, because I, I cut this out beforehand. And then I'm just going to fold that back over, make sure that that's, that that iron is all the way on the piece. Now, um, like I said, I cut this out before, um, before I went ahead and did the heat, the heat transfer. You don't have to do that, but I found that it actually saves me metal, you know, then from having to take an entire piece and, uh, line it up and then I've got all this metal that's being eaten away. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I prefer to cut mine out. But you can actually acid etch an entire sheet like this, you know, onto a sheet of silver all at once and then put your design on and cut it out. But I've just found that this is easier. Plus I've found that my designs are more accurate. So um, anyhow, while that's going one more time, I'm going to explain to you uh, the reason why we have the ferric nitrate on the candle warmer. Okay, there really is a pretty good reason. Um, remember I said that by, I cut down my time by agitating my, um, ag agitating my ferric nitrate. 
Um, well, I cut it down an awful lot more by, by taking up somebody's recommendation and actually heating my ferric nitrate before I put it in there. Um, I went from about three hours etching time, just swishing it around, you know, cold ferric nitrate, to um, uh, 30 minutes, about. It takes me about 30 minutes to actually do that. So um, anyhow, in the meantime, I also want to show you, this is another piece that I have in the works. I'm going to be um, getting both of these in at the same time. So there are some parts right here in the middle, because I have a hallmark on the back of it. There are some parts that, um, this part right here, it doesn't have the design, you know, completely transferred. I'll be honest, I'm not worried about that at all, because there's going to be a big honk and turquoise sitting right there or something I haven't quite decided yet. Either way, there's going to be a big honking stone sitting right there. So anyhow, now that that's been on there for another few minutes, and we know that the metal's good and hot, it's not a very thick piece of metal. And you can't overcook your metal, so be careful with that, or rather your design. Now I'm going to go in and do a really, really, really good job burnishing. I'm going to burnish everything but this end. You notice I'm going diagonally. I'm making sure I get right along the edges, and I usually like to start with one end and then work my way down to the other. I'm going to do everything but the very, very end, which is probably going to end up turning out okay anyhow. So you really want to just kind of go around, especially with this piece of silver right here that's all wavy. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to set this right here aside, we'll check it here in a minute, but it's pretty hot. So I'm going to set it down on my block, that's why I have my block here is because the cold steel and the warm metal and the hot metal, it, you know, it does a really good job of cooling it off pretty quickly. Now I'm going to show you how I'm going to prep this piece right here, and then all you have to do is drop it in your acid and turn on your agitator, whatever that may be. So the first thing that I do is I get myself a strip. Sometimes it takes two strips on really wide pieces. Is I'll get myself a strip and measure it out of just regular standard shipping tape, nothing major. Let's get that out of the way. I'll set the strip down. And then I'm going to try, I'm going to take the back side of this and line it up. Set it down, and of course, you know, you got all that sticky tape, and then I flip it over, kind of peeled up a little bit to get out any ridges, okay, anything that, that might not have adhered. Rub my thumb up it. You guys are going to see this finished piece here before too long. Now, as you guys can see, it's really important to make sure that nothing gets in underneath the piece, so I'm going to go around this entire piece and really just kind of push the tape up against the edge of the metal. Now for some of you who um, who have been doing this for a little while, I'm sure that you already know, chances are you're not really watching the video anyway, but um, it's a good idea for, you know, if you've got a really good thick piece of metal, sometimes it's a good idea to take a permanent marker and go around the outside, uh, one of the oil based ones, or um, even better, you can, um, you can go ahead and uh, get some nail polish if it's a good thick chunk, okay? So anyhow, you want to make sure there's really no air bubbles around the outside edge. Take a look at it in the light. Make sure that everything has been sufficiently pressed down so you don't have any, any seepage in between the tape. And again, this right here was another really wavy piece. And now we're going to check this one. Okay, this is how I check mine to make sure that my transfer actually goes on. Oh, it actually did go on. Is I'll peel it up part way. Go, okay, that one's good. I'll turn it around. And I'll peel it up part way, and it's kind of got a little spot right there that, that could use some work. And I'm not peeling it all the way off, because if I really wanted to, actually it's not terrible, and I'm probably going to cut most of that off anyway. Um, but if I really wanted to, now what I'd do, and I will just for instructional purposes, set it back down. Everything has been peeled up but this middle piece, and I know that this end right here is the end that um, didn't completely transfer over. So I'm just going to, if you peel it all the way off, you can't do this, okay? <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, if you peel it all the way off, you cannot reline it. I mean, maybe you can, but it won't be the same. 
Um, but anyhow, so I just kind of peel up the ends and leave about an inch or two strip, you know, just kind of feel for it. And then I'll peel up the other end and go, okay, well, that, that looks good. And then take the rest of it off and take my chances with the middle piece. But at least this way, a majority of the time, it's going to be your ends that you're going to find that um, don't completely don't completely etch. And I like to like fold in my tape a little bit as much as I can just because I hate the stickiness. There we go. Now, I'm going to open this up, slide it in, and it is ready to go. So now all I have to do is finish up this piece right here. I'm going to go ahead and reheat it for a minute, and then I'm going to take my ferric nitrate and uh, pour it in there after I get this other piece prepped, but you guys won't have to worry about it. I'm sure you can figure that out again. Um, so anyhow, while this one right here is heating up, uh, just keep in mind you don't necessarily have to do this is what I call a blanket design where I just take an entire sheet of a pattern and print it out what you can do is you can take let's say there's a picture of this beautiful bird or a peacock or something like that and you want to acid edge it you can do that as well you can do any shapes you can do any size um, you can do just about anything that your little heart desires um, and then just go ahead and hand saw around that design so that's definitely possible too. Or, well, you can hand side or you can use one of these fabulous little beauties right here. This is one of, another one of Kevin Potter's pancake dies. And if you guys haven't seen my collection yet, it's not as big as I'd like for it to be. And it's growing, but it's still sizable. Anyhow, so that's a great way to just kind of punch out your designs as well. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and reburnish this. Oh, yeah, it's pretty good and warm. And I'm just going to go in right where I remember that one little spot being that I wasn't terribly happy with. And then I'll give the whole thing a once over just because I can. Go around the edges. Because you really want to get the edges on, especially if you're doing your cutout before. And this right here I have a hallmark on as well, so again, there's a good possibility that, um, there's a good possibility that that center piece right there won't completely burnish on, not with that, not with that size burnisher anyway. But um, if you're going to do this and you don't want to worry about the hallmark, you know, preventing you from actually burnishing because it compresses the metal and leaves a negative image. Okay, number one, I set stones over my hallmark, so I never worry about it. Um, otherwise, you can just uh, wait until you're finished with your etch and find some place to hallmark. But again it's going to leave a negative image anyways depending on how big your hallmark is and mine's pretty good size okay so this cools off pretty quickly and I don't remember which end that it was that end looks good and I guess it doesn't really matter so we're going to peel it off and before I completely peel it off there's another little spot so what I'm going to do is go ahead and close this back up and then I will go back through now that I know where that little spot is. I'm going to reheat it and reburnish it. So sometimes, and the problem with this one, I can tell you right now the reason why I'm having such a hard time getting a good edge on it or a good transfer is because of the waviness and the contour of the metal. Okay, You want your metal as flat as possible. The flatter the better. If you have a sheet that you bought straight from Rio Grande and you want to do a blanket etch on it, you are not going to have a problem one. But on pieces like this that I've hand rolled, you know, there's going to be a couple of issues because it's wavy, it's been cut out, it's been manipulated, it's been hammered, it's been abused six ways to Sunday. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to finish this up, but in the meantime, when I get finished again, I'm just going to tape off the back and then pour my ferric, pour, put it in there, pour my ferric nitrate on, click that on, and in about a half an hour, I'm going to have a gorgeous image. And then I can go ahead and work from that. So I hope you guys have a good time uh, trying this out. One of, one of the best things about acid etching is it is one of the cheapest things to get into. It's a great way to be able to add designs to a piece of metal. And then you can just cut it out in a circle. You can cut it out into squares, punch a hole in it, and sell it to somebody, you know, with a little cleanup. So acid etching is just, it's an amazing way to get any design that you want to on it, especially if you're using a computer design. So I hope you guys found that somewhat informative. I'm going to finish this up. And, uh, well, happy creating, you guys. Take care.